It's time for the wrestling perspective. That guy is Lars Too Sweet Fredrickson. What's going on, my friend? Oh, you know, just uh, running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And um, obviously on a different time zone than the both of you guys. So, um, you know, I had to stop playing grab ass and get on here as soon as I could. (laughs) How are you doing today, Dennis? I'm doing good, man. I'm excited to do this. And this is a guy that you and I have been going back and forth for months now. Like, hey, we need to get this guy on. Uh, I'll be like, hey, what about this week? And then we're like, oh, man, uh, we, we've got Kurt Angle. Sorry, Alex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, know, com- nice comparison, <laughs> Kurt Angle. <laughs> but, but, we, but we always are like – Let's try to get this guy on. Let's try to get in. And here we are finally. And before we were recording, I was telling you, I became a fan of yours in November when uh, you GCW came to Detroit. I text Lars immediately like, dude, this Alex Cologne is phenomenal. And he's like, I know I've been a fan of his longer than you. And he has. So thank you so much, Alex Cologne, for coming to hang out with us. You're welcome. No problem. Appreciate you guys having me on. So, uh, I got to ask you, you were very vocal about having a shoot job yeah. and being a wrestler. Do you, do you feel like in the wrestling industry, you're not as appreciated as you should be? Because, look, you're you're accomplished. Uh, you ultra ultraviolet champion. Uh, you have won all these deathmatch tournaments. You put your body on the line. And, and here you are still having to have a regular job. Do you, do you kind of feel like that's like a, a kick in the balls? No, um, you know, we're, we're taught, every wrestler's taught from the very beginning, wrestling owes you nothing. So you really don't, you shouldn't go in expecting a bunch. And sometimes people get lucky. They, re- they really do. Sometimes people go hit the jackpot, you know, may, they might talk to smack and they'll hit the jackpot or they might be humble and hit the jackpot. But other guys don't always get that privilege. You know, unfortunately, I'm uh, one of those guys who doesn't get the privilege. I had, still have to work. A regular job but like like i said you know we're, we're taught from the beginning in wrestling school wrestling owes you literally nothing like if anything you're the one carrying the burden in that whole relationship wrestling is carrying none of that like <laughs> it's all on you at the end of the day well one of the things that i noticed about you and what makes you i, I feel like what makes you different from a lot of uh, deathmatch wrestlers is the fact uh, in the ways that you can tell a story and how you come in the ring how you hold your persona you know, how you do these things. But what I really want to know is, is what led you into the whole deathmatch arena? Well, I, I've been into deathmatching since uh, even watching FMW. Like early 2000s, I've, I found uh, the earlier FMW stuff when LimeWire was really prevalent. You had Kazaa, those later versions of Napster. Um, me and my friends would download stuff and we found like FMW stuff with Hayabusa and Onita. And then that's where I started finding like CZW stuff. And then they were also on uh, public access. And that's where I seen Sick Nick Mondo, Nick Gage, um, Justice Payne, Lobo, Zandig. And I was like, oh, they're using glass. Like uh, that, this isn't fake wrestling. This isn't even ECW. This is hard, more hardcore than ECW. And uh, I got really into it. So then when I broke into the business, initially I wanted to be a deathmatch wrestler. Uh, but you know, I let, obviously people kind of talk you into the route of learn how to wrestle before you start doing that, because too many guys that get into the wrestling industry who want to be hardcore wrestlers to get caught into the loop of, Hey, I want to be a hardcore wrestler from the get go. Forget about learning how to do hold and psychology. Uh, just get me in the ring. I'll do a bunch of cool shit and then I'll do it with weapons. And then that'll compensate for all the loss of, of technical mat skill and psychology. So I was one of the rare guys who decided to hone his skills in first before I jumped into it. So then by the time I jumped into it, I was pretty much ready from the get-go. Almost like getting thrown into a pool of cold water, your body goes into shock. Do you still remember that first, you know, that first death match hit that you took? Was it what you were expecting? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was rough. Talk about it. I'm very curious about that. I don't think Lars and I ever really asked that that question of what was that first hit like? Did it make you change your mind? Did you did you buck up? What what was it? Well, I definitely knew I was uh, I was in a different realm because it's not it's not like regular wrestling. Like, yeah, I get it. Regular wrestling itself is is a hard thing to do like you gotta have you gotta have mental toughness as well as physical but like death matching is uh, to me it's as real as it gets when it comes to professional wrestling there's nothing more real than being in a death match because you know you're going in there and 
you're going to commit bodily harm to your opponent and you're going to commit bodily harm to yourself and mentally. And that's why a lot of people say, man, these deathmatch guys have to be mentally screwed up. And for the most part, I mean, most of us <laughs> have some type of trauma in our lives that forced us into this situation, <laughs> as Danny Havoc would say. Um, but like, yeah, that's just the way it is, man. We, we expect these things. Um, we'll go back to the question. Uh, yeah, the first time I ever did something with Danny Havoc, um, it really threw me into shock. I remember after the match saying, dude, I don't know if I could do this. I was like, this is, this is rough. Like I was physically completely drained, like more so than having a regular match. And um, I don't know. I just, I did it a couple more times and then it ended up just becoming kind of like second nature. But that first one was really mentally and physically draining because I wasn't used to that type of physical mental abuse. Well, that's what I kind of wanted to point to, to my last question is the fact that you know, not only do you bring your skill, and I, and I agree with you 100%, I feel like the fundamentals have to be there for a great deathmatch wrestler, as you pointed out. But it's like the mental thing going in there, you know, it's obviously way different than a normal match because, you, like you said, you're going in there to inflict bodily harm on your opponent. And not only that, but get bodily harm <laughs> done mm -hmm. to you. So how do you keep the mindset? Because I know, listen, I don't know if it's just me, but if somebody kept hitting me, I would lose my shit. At some point, I would just lose it. And, uh, you know, how do you stay focused? Like this is, yes, it's it, it's violence. Yes, it's real, but it's also performance. That's just a mental mind state when it comes to professional wrestling. Um, you know, breaking into the industry, just even in regular wrestling, uh, you go from having a certain aspect of life. Like I was a, I was a kid, not per se to say mostly a street kid, but I came from you know, a family that was into that, like a Latin family, very machismo, um, you know, drugs and street culture involved. I had friends in gangs, friends who sold drugs, friends who hung out in the streets and did bad things, ended up in juvie or prison, you know, so already that already is in my mind and getting into wrestling, you can't think like that. I was taught, I was kind of reconditioned once I got into wrestling to think differently. Like you have to, to it's fucked up to say, but you have to obey and you have to like stay the straight and narrow. Like you're trying to tell a story. If you start going into what they would say business for yourself and, and trying to beat people up and stuff nine times out of 10, it won't go well for you, especially being a young guy in the business. So you're getting into it, you're reconditioned to think a certain way. So then when you get into death matches, that, that way of thinking stays with you. You always stay on the straight and narrow path for the most part. As you get older with experience, you can kind of drift off, especially if young guys piss you off, you, <laughs> you can drift off and, uh, and you know what I mean? Like add a little bit of discipline, but for the most part, like you, ha you have a very focused mind in wrestling and that just comes from uh, you being conditioned from the get go. Right. You're, you're officially a veteran in the wrestling industry and you've talked before in the past about uh, in your shoot job, having to hide being a wrestler because yeah. you didn't want the questions. You didn't want the judgment. Yeah. You've talked about having friends coming from the street, having to hide like in wrestling because you didn't want to be called a pansy. And it was viewed that way from the streets. Now that you're a veteran, are you secure enough in, in what you do and who you are to be open about being a deathmatch wrestler? Or do you still hide that aspect? Uh, no, I think that was more so like just when you're a young guy, you're still, especially like I started at 23, which is later than a lot of guys nowadays are starting. But like you still have an immature mindset. You're not grown enough to understand that that maybe people won't judge you as harshly. Like I have friends that I went to high school that'll hit me up and be like, Oh my God, dude, I can't believe you're, you're wrestling and you're going to different countries. That's, that's insane, man. I wish I could do something like that. You know? And when I first started wrestling, that wasn't my mindset. It was like, Oh, I don't want my friends to find out. They'll probably think I'm doing this fake wrestling stuff. Uh, they're out there, you know, working, providing for their family or doing something they shouldn't be doing. That's more real than what I'm doing. And I felt like it was, it was more of a, like, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm a man, a machismo, like that machismo, that man, that, that whole charisma thing, like in real life, like you want to be this tough guy, but in wrestling, like it, everyone wants to be the tough guy, but in reality, nobody's really the tough guy. You never start out that way. Can I ask a follow-up Lars? Yeah. Um, at, at your shoot job, have you ever had someone come up to you and go, dude, you're Alex Cologne. I, I, I just saw that match. And oh my gosh, because yeah. to me, that has to be the cool validating moment. Uh, I've had that happen at work, my, my shoot job, but it, the opposite way. And you're like, wrestling fan, come on, dude, you're 44. And then you just go, yeah, I know, but I do it with Lars. I mean, come on. So you try to find something you can. So I, I'm on the opposite. Oh, great. Throw me under the bus. You know what I mean? I, it's like, I'm trying to stay away from looking like your friend most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Two different Most worlds of entertainment, man. Now. I'm sorry, what? I said we're me and Lars are two, we're both two different worlds of entertainment, but they're both entertainment. So like they always say wrestling wrestling is like rock and roll. It's it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's the the culture I can't nowadays, it's different. The new generation is right. really cleaned up, cleaned up wrestling. But when I broke in, it was it was that it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, sex, drugs, music. That was everything. That's the, that's the motto guys lived by. Now it's a little bit different. The young guys have, have uh, taken a step towards more, more so away from that uh, toxic culture. But when I broke in, it was just, it was kind of like an outlaw thing. Yeah, I mean, and that's the one of the things that I've always found uh, where I've connected with professional wrestlers is because of the, the, you know, our jobs are obviously very different, but yet they're the same. They're very physical, right? They're a performance mm -hmm. and it's all about the traveling and the sort of uncertainty of tomorrow, you know, because and that's that happens in any kind of performer's world, really, you know, unless you're like, you know, fucking Michael Jordan or whatever. But then you're <laughs> then you're now you're just a crying meme. So, you know, I don't know. But anyways, my I, the question I really wanted to ask is, you know, throughout the years that I've been a professional wrestling fan, um, one of the things that I that I have noticed between uh, people who work together is that they share a sort, certain intimacy. You know, because you have to be able to trust this person with your body, et cetera, right? And you kind of get closer uh, to someone in a different way, but it's a closest like maybe your partner or what, or, you know, might not, might not have with you. Do you find that like, because I know you've had matches that aren't death matches, mm -hmm. right? And you have relationships, I'm sure, with those people. But did you find like a truer or a, a different, deeper connection with the death match wrestling? Like, do you walk in after the guy, you know, you two? you know, and just like fucking hug because you made it out alive in a sense, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, death, I've learned death matchings. The locker room's different. The the culture, everything's different uh, outside of regular wrestling. Because for a while, that first 10 years, I was strictly in, in like more higher end indie, like bigger stars and stuff like that. And then when, it, when you go into a death match for a locker room, it's people, I'm a one, one, I don't want to be disrespectful and be like, oh, well, everyone's trying to step on each other. But when you're in, you're in a tank full of sharks, everybody's kind of trying to eat each other. Yeah. You know, in a deathmatch locker room, I feel like everyone tries to work together more. We, we kind of understand we're uh, putting each other's bodies in, our, in each other's hands more so in a we get we're going to get hurt way worse than somebody who's going to just wrestle a regular mat, a mat like technician type of match. I mean, we're cutting our, our bodies up. You know what I mean? We're bleeding together, sometimes getting badly cut, badly hurt, ending up in the hospital. So we're going to obviously have a deeper connection. So I, I noticed that the minute I walked into a deathmatch locker room compared to walking into a normal wrestling locker room, it's like I felt like there was less bad intentions uh, mm. for pe when it came to people just trying to step on each other. And, and everyone didn't really have a means of having an ulterior motive because, you know, deathmatch wrestling is a niche genre. You know what I mean? We're in our eyes, we're only going so far. We're not like these dudes who are like, we're going to get on TV. We're going to get titles. We're going to go here, there, there. Death matching is this small and we're all trying to get a piece of the pie and it's easier for us to get there together than one single person. And that's just the way that it was viewed when I uh, came into a death match lock room compared to just a regular lock room. I've said this before and I'm still very new to the death match culture. And I guess maybe my assumption is uh, in the past, deathmatch wrestling was not really appreciated by, by wrestling fans, mainstream or not. A at what point do you feel like the culture has, and, and if the culture has turned where, you know, it's more acceptable? Because I, I assume you guys may not get paid as much as regular wrestling, and, and that respect isn't there in that aspect. Am I wrong? No, um, when I broke in, uh, deathmatch wrestling and guys who participated in such were just considered like guys who couldn't wrestle, guys who couldn't like compete or they couldn't hack it uh, on the upper echelon of the independents or on TV or wherever it was that they were. They, they were we were just guys that that oh uh, well we were compensating for what we couldn't do in a normal wrestling ring. Uh, you know, nowadays is completely different. I feel like. Uh, when the pandemic hit for whatever reason, I feel like deathmatch wrestling was like number one, like deathmatch wrestling kind of like took the lead. And that's where you, people started actually noticing, oh man, they're, they're not just out there hitting each other with stuff. They're actually wrestling. And like a lot of guys put hard work into that, that whole scenario. But yeah, I feel like the pandemic played a big picture because when everybody else like mainstream companies 
and and regular wrestlers kind of like took a back seat and said we're going to wait this out like the deathmatch scene and the fans of deathmatch wrestling kind of pushed it past everyone well you know i've been a deathmatch fan you know probably i don't know if since its inception but I'm, i mean i remember it just being you know because you can trace the roots all the way back to maybe memphis you know, with yeah. Lawler and Dundee or the concession stand brawl or, Terry you know, Punk's dad. Yeah, you know, I mean, and if you think about it, like what uh, catapulted Cactus Jack and Terry Funk into a whole another level was deathmatch wrestling. And it, yeah, it was done in Japan. And I think that like, you know, ECW almost made it palatable, you know, for a larger audience. Um, as we're seeing now that like you actually have deathmatch companies now that not just like, because FMW, would have a death match but there would be other wrestling mm -hmm. you know involved and some of these death match companies i see they, they, it uh i want your opinion on them because i see it in a certain way where they actually build the matches within a, like like a traditional re wrestling um event you know that kind of builds up yeah. um do you do you see the same kind of stuff and are you happy that there's 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 death match uh specific companies yeah, uh, of course. I feel like, you know, we, everything's built properly nowadays, even with a whole deathmatch show compared to how it was years and years ago. Um, I feel like, honestly, I feel like we can, as a whole, can do even better than what we're doing right now. Because sometimes I feel like we get caught in this mundane, like, just throw them to the wolves, put everything in there and then let them go. But then when you get to the sixth, seventh match, and then you've already seen a 200 light tube deathmatch about four other times, it becomes kind of like, ah, uh, and then that's where that just falls under like not even just show psychology, but just the psychology of a, of a of a wrestler. Like if you're a smart enough deathmatch wrestler, you know, if somebody's done it about five times before you, you're not going to do it, you know, the sixth time. So, I mean, sometimes you'll get you'll get that where people will understand that and they'll apply it. And then sometimes you won't. I mean, I feel like to, it's still sometimes a crapshoot, but deathmatch as a whole, when it comes to shows, just building certain things. Like it's definitely um, evolved compared to what it used to be. We've had a handful of guys on, and I've always wanted to ask this question. I never either remembered or have, but uh, it seems like in deathmatch wrestling, you have two types of guys, guys that just get one little prick and then they bleed and gush out. Yeah. And guys that you can see bone and there's no blood coming out. Did, did that kind of play in like when you're getting started, you're like, what kind of bleeder am I going to be? Am I going to be <laughs> crimson mask or am I going to be a, <laughs> that's a that, you know what? That's a great fucking question. Like that. I mean, that's totally deep inside the mind. I'm sorry. I have to give credit where credit is yeah. due. Alex. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. mean to cut you off. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Um, that's what a lot of us guys that are in the death match genre call fresh back. So you have guys who have less scars. And you'll notice when you have less scars, you tend to bleed way more easier. Uh, mm. And then when you when you accumulate these scars, it becomes harder for anything sharp to like penetrate uh, scar tissue uh, and it may, to, with to which it makes you bleed. Um, and then that's where you go into the, you have guys that might use some aspirin before a match to thin out their blood so they could get more blood. But for the most part, if someone's newer in in a deathmatch genre itself, it's their first couple matches they're going to bleed a lot. They don't have too many scars to protect them from all the cuts and scrapes that you get from light tubes and gussets and razors. What kind of bleeder are you? I am a, <laughs> I'm a, um, I'm a, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I do my stuff very naturally. Like I don't want to break the fourth wall, but you know, I've shocked people even in Japan when, when uh, they'll have their little blade and um, they're like, don't you want one? No. I'll just, <laughs> it'll happen out there or it doesn't. That's just the way yeah. I operate. Well, you know, I, so we've seen deathmatch wrestling kind of come into a totally, I mean, we had a deathmatch fucking wrestling match on national TV. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris Jericho, Nick Gage, right? So then you think about guys like Matt Cardona coming in, doing the deathmatch wrestling. And so now it's like, it's almost as the people that you would least expect to do it are now doing it or touching their, you know, putting their toes in it. Is that a sense of like gratitude for you or a sense of like, uh, how would I say? Not maybe not gratitude's the wrong word, but the fact that it is getting notoriety by, you know, let's say, I'll, I can't, I mean, I'll use this term loosely. Maybe it applies maybe to Chris Jericho, but bigger stars are now stepping their foot into this realm that you've been there, you know, working it up i mean do you feel like a uh gratified 
gratification. Is there any gratification or are you just kind of like, eh, you know, that's kind of my shit. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to like get dirt or anything. I just kind of want to know where you're headed. It's to me, it's just the evolution. Like, and it's happened with tons of different styles of wrestling. Like what Ricochet and Will Ospreay were doing when they were first doing all the, the crazy, like choreographed stuff. How many people, how many wrestlers were like, ah, I'm not cool with that. The next thing you know, Ricky Morton's doing a Canadian destroyer. Am I wrong? You know? So like, it's just the evolution. Like you're going to have where people fight against, they resist against what's, what's uh, new, what's uh, not the norm for them. And then eventually you find that some entities will come in from that side of the, the field and they'll start joining our side and then it becomes more accepted. And that's what's happening with, with death matching. It's becoming more accepted. And you got, you have guys like Buff Bagwell who's calling me out on Twitter. I'm like, what's Buff Bagwell doing? It's not 1998. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> But Dude, it's bro, like all I need, all I need you to do is just come out with a fucking top hat to the next fucking GCW event. Just wear that top hat. You know, Alex is the stuff, baby. Dude, I'm in, I'm intense, man. I'm intense. Uh, <laughs> I know, even for I these know. older guys that had uh, TV jobs, I'm like, this is my world. You're stepping into it. You're, you're uh, signing a lease uh, <laughs> on your body and uh, I'll cut who I have to cut. That's just the way I was raised. <laughs> right, 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 right. I've asked a couple of questions based around your respect in the industry, but I'm going back to the well one more time here. Yeah. You ultraviolet champion in what might be one of the hottest independent companies, GCW, but yet you don't seem to be the face of the company. And I, I, for me, as a fan of yours, I go, all right, it's, it's kind of a hardcore company. He's the hardcore champion, but yet, you know, I don't feel like you are being – pushed or, or marketed what do you have to do what more do you have to do i don't know shoot a politician <laughs> can, Allegedly. Kidnap, can maybe kidnap lars i don't i don't know what no. it's gonna take dude but... i'll come willingly what are you talking about Hang out with you for a little bit sure fucking hey hey don't don't tempt fate because you'll be at a show the next thing you know we're at the bar and you're like i'll do this anymore this isn't my life he'll be in detroit <laughs> Uh, it might be <laughs> but uh, i don't know man i think that's just wrestling like uh i wish i had an explanation yeah i guess to, listen i let it get me bitter sometimes and then you know uh i just realized that that that's just wrestling like i said it doesn't owe me anything and i i tussle with it back and forth i'm like ah, oh, i should be i should be in la every show or i should be here but it, it's wrestling it doesn't work like that i'm not the boss i don't make those decisions all i know is when it when boss the boss calls me, he says, we're on the show. I know I'm going to go there to kill it. And that's just, I go there to do my job. And then that's what it is. I, I will say that is not a criticism on GCW, my question. I just see you as a champion in the up and coming hardcore thing. And I feel like maybe not even company wide, but even fans still don't give you the just deserve that you own. So I just want to clarify that. I'm not saying what is GCW. Oh, no, you're doing? good. I'll, that's GCW does it sometimes. <laughs> I'll say whatever. I don't care. But like, uh, Fans are fans uh, have opinions. And as we all know, even with music and social media podcasts, people have opinions and uh, opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. So at the end of the day, people are going to like you and people are going to hate you. I had a friend recently uh, who I was talking to and I was like, yeah, but, you know, fans are always split with me 50 50. I'm like, I feel like the John Cena. They're just mad because I'm winning all the time. And he's like, yeah, hey, you, dude, you're, he was like, you're just, you're a polarizing character. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just opinionated. So, like, not everybody agrees on my opinion. And that's where you get where you'll have people who agree, who don't agree. So you're never going to win the whole populace. It just doesn't work like that. Even in music, you're never going to win everybody. Some people you're going to win, some people you're going to lose. You just have to take your chances on the right side. Well, I always feel like if you're pissing somebody off, then you're doing your job. Exactly. You know what I mean? And because not because if you're doing something that's creative and next level, people are going to have a reaction to that. You know what I mean? And I feel like I've done that a few times in my life and I'm not like trying to toot toot. But what I'm trying to do is come back to you and say, it's like you're the way that you kind of come in and do a match is unique to yourself. It's it's quick. It's physical. You make the other guy look as good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's never like a one-sided thing. I feel like you give as good as you take. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask is like, so when you're back there with a the match and you're kind of working it out, like you guys do, I mean, are, you know, and I know that probably certain spots are called, but how much of, of deathmatch wrestling is just on the fly? Or does is it a case-by-case -case scenario? I think it's a case-by-case. Because -case. you'll wrestle Matt Tremont. Matt Tremont is 100% at least 
85 to 90 percent, he's on the fly. He doesn't like to call a lot. Same thing with Nick Gage, 85, 90 percent, he's on the fly. But you'll wrestle me, and if I know you have a certain acumen, I'm gonna call a lot of stuff because I know right. we can hold up. But right. if I know if you're if you're better on the fly, we're not gonna call a lot of stuff. So it just it's case by case. Everybody's different. Is is there a spot that makes you cringe that you just don't like to do? And if you have to, you'll do it, but you just you just try to stay away from it? Shit. No, I usually just stay away from them. Uh so good one. I was in Mexico. <laughs> I was in Mexico. If you guys know what Zona 23 is, that junk yes. in Mexico. Yes, so we're yes. in Mexico and somebody put a pineapple with toothpicks. And if you know anything about toothpicks, you get them things lodged in you, you're not getting them out and they will get infected. So I literally grabbed the pineapple and I chucked it across the junkyard. And I was like, not today, not today, Mexico. So if I, <laughs> if I see something, I'm getting rid of it. Um, I usually, if I take something once, I'll take it more than once. Um, I'm just, there's certain things like needles. I'm not good with needles and certain other things, yeah. but I'm pretty like smart when it comes to knowing what to take and what not to take. Cause usually if I take it once, I'll take it twice. Maybe not a weed whacker. Maybe the weed whacker is the one I could give you. Maybe, maybe. Well, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to ask because like there is a lot of places now where that will host deathmatch wrestling. Are you at a certain point where you're just like, if they pay me enough, I'm showing up. I don't care what the, 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 uh, cause I, for me, I'm 50 and I've toured in every kind of fucking place, whether it's the smallest shitter or the biggest, whatever, you know what I mean? But now I'm like, I'm 50, got a family. I got these things, right? So now I'm a little bit more picky and choosy. Are you still, are you like that? Or are you just kind of like, if you pay me the money, I'm showing up and I'm going to do my damnedest. No, I, I, uh, I pick and choose, you know, and I'm, I'm close to 40. So, um, it's not like when I was in my early twenties, I could just, I'll take whatever. Right. Oh, I'll be there. Give me gas money. I'll be there now, especially with death matching. And it takes such a toll on your body. Now I'm just yeah. like, I pick and choose that. I like, I always tell the young guys, if you're going to do something, make sure there's a benefit. Like if you're not making a lot of money, Make sure there's some type of exposure or you're connecting with somebody that can help you get to the next level. Like there should always be a benefit on your end when it comes to what you're doing and where you're doing. And if there's not, then don't take the booking because it's not going to benefit you. This is all to benefit you. It's a selfish business, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like people need to take that into account. Like we make friends. Sometimes we make money. But at the end of the day, you're no one else is going to get you past the door. They can help you knock on it but it's your job to walk through that door. Is it not, you know? Yeah. Lars, you touched on something that I kind of want to swing back to, and that's your family dynamic. You have a woman, you have a daughter. Do Are they kind of urging you? Or did, a, does your daughter watch any of your matches? B, at this point in your career, is is your, your woman, wife, fiance, girlfriend, does she say, why are you still doing this? Stop. Um. She calls me stupid. <laughs> but like that's weird. I was gonna it, intro you that way. I've been I've been uh, <laughs> I've been doing I've been wrestling for 15 years and no one's gonna stop me. But like my mom always tells me I need to be careful, but she never tells me, hey, you need to stop. She she understands this is what I want to do, but she always urges me to to take it easy. You know what I mean? Uh be careful. So same thing with with uh my daughter's mom, same, same issue. Uh when it comes to my daughter, I don't let her watch my matches they're too violent and it, as a father like sometimes i'll see kids in the crowd watching death matches and i'm a little like ah should your kid be out here watching this like is this you know wait till they get to an age where they can decide for themselves until then you're doing something called parenting and when it comes to my daughter when when she gets to an age where she can make the decision to say hey i want to watch one of your death matches cool but until then it's my job to kind of like you know shield her from things like that that, that, that answer makes me feel like such a terrible parent because like I sit with my 10 year old watching death matches, but you know, I, then again, he's also a lot more mature for his age and has an older brother yeah. and it's something that fascinates him. He likes all kinds of wrestling. And that's just kind of like even Petey Williams, who used to be the host of a show had brought his daughter to a, to a, an independent show on a death. He didn't know there was a death match on the card yeah. and his young daughter, that was the match that she gravitated to. You know what I mean? So, it, I, you know, it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting thing that you said, like, you know, as a father, you know, I move in this world over here, you know, and it's, and I'm assuming it's probably for the benefit, benefit of your daughter. And so she can have a better life than you did, because that's why we do these things, right? That's why mm -hmm. we sacrifice. Um, has there ever been a moment for you in the ring 
or maybe even at a show where you've second guessed like what you chose to do? Not so much what I chose to do, but uh, um, how do I say? Like uh, I've I've so I've been in the hospital after a death match and um, went into shock where I literally thought I was going to die. I'm seeing lights and right, I was right, fading right. in and out. And it's, it's during those times where I'll ask myself, like, man, what am I doing? Like, should I be doing this? Like, I have all this time I should be spending with my daughter instead I'm out here, like, hurting my body. Because when I get older, it's not going to, it's not, you know, it's not going to pay me any dividends on my body. I'm going to be <laughs> limping around on whatever walker or, or wheelchair. And then she's going to be wondering why that's why I'm like that. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that uh, it crosses my mind. You know, and it's just in those specific instances. I don't really, I try, when I go into death matches, I just, uh, I sound stupid, but I try to have a warrior mentality. You go in there, you know, you're going to war. Regardless if the outcome is predetermined, when I'm in the back of that curtain, before I go out, I am mentally preparing myself to go to war with these guys. Like, it's a war up until the finish for me. Like, we're fighting until we get to the finish. And then whoever's supposed to go up goes up. But up until that point, we're we're in a war, man, and that's just the way I see it when I'm in there. I can definitely tell by the look on your face when you come out to the ring. <laughs> Sorry, Dennis, but the focus, the and that's one of the things I think a lot of people admire about you is that focus. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. You, you just said that you came out of the hospital. We asked Lance Archer this about his neck after the injury, but what was that first match like after you come out of the hospital? Are you a little shy? Are you you timid? Do you go in head first? Because in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, shit, this is what got me there in the first place. Well, you're riding you're riding a lot of waves. You're literally because at the, I was wrestling Danny Havoc in his retirement match. So we do whatever the match happens. We do something uh, you won't be able to see, but I have a huge scar on his hand. My hand split open. The back of my head split open. Uh, I was essentially bleeding out, went to the hospital, spent about eight hours there, went into shock. They, they pumped me into a bunch of IVs, um, and it, I was taking a chance. And it was mm. scary, but at the same time, it was like, I want to say I felt accomplished, but I felt accomplished to some degree. Like, I accomplished something. Like, all these people were talking about what I did last night so at the same time feeling some sort of shame like oh dude what am i doing i'm like i'm putting myself my body on the line i mean we should really get paid more for this but i'm putting my body on the line uh in of something very dangerous but at the same time i'm like oh this is awesome I'm, i feel so accomplished like i actually did something that mattered so you're very in those situations you're just very conflicted at least from my personal experience i'll go through these things and at times i'll just be very conflicted about it well, you know, if you really think about it, and I started kind of listening to what you're saying, as a fan, <clears throat> I'm cheering for you to basically kill the other guy, yeah. right? That's kind of what I'm doing. That's my mindset, right? Because you guys are doing, you guys are kind of being the voice to the voiceless. Like, I can't just go down the street and start smashing people with light tubes. or you can. Hitting somebody. Well, I possibly could get away with it, you know, the people <laughs> I know. Maybe, but my, no, I, I think I'm too, too high profile for that. But my point is at what point, and I, I know what you're saying and I relate to it in such a, a weird way, in a way, because it's not about the ego. It's about the art in a weird way. Mm -hmm. That's what's the gratifying part. And I do see professional wrestling as an art form. And it's not just a performance. It's a physical, I mean, you're putting your life on the line basically, and especially in the genre. And if you think of all the greats that we talk about, they've all had a brush with death in the ring, whether it be Nick Gage, whether it be G. Raver, yourself, Tremont, you know, the list can go on ad infinitum. It can go on. June Kasai, uh, uh, Abdullah Kobashi. Like, there's so many guys who have been put in the position where they've had to have hospitalization mm -hmm. for the sake of the art. So at the end of the day, is like, is that what this is all really about for you? Is 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 it about the art form? Is it about these little, you know, moments, these paintings, let's say, for lack of a better term, that you're leaving behind? Yeah, absolutely. It's 100% about the moments. It's about uh, your love for for professional wrestling. Like, no one, no one who does death matches. I really don't care who you are. You could be Masashi Takeda, Jukasai you do not get paid enough to do this to your body at all. And that's 100% the truth. And everybody that does this knows it. You do not get paid enough 
for what you do to your body. At the end of the day, what's gratifying is coming out of a match and saying, I accomplished something. People are going to remember this specific moment. And every time I step in the ring, that's what I, I try to aim to do something that people are going to remember. Literally, I do not. What, that's why. And then you asked me earlier, hey, do you like pick specific shows that you do and stuff? Yes, I do, because I don't want to just have a match for having a match just because oh, right. I need the money. I'm going to have this match. I have a shoot job for a reason, so I don't have to do that. Right. But it's like, right. which is primarily why I have a shoot job. So I don't have to do that because uh, otherwise I could probably make it with wrestling barely, but I could. Um, it's like, I do it because I want, I want to create moments and, you know, not a lot of deathmatch guys in the past have had a chance to do that because it's always been viewed as like, Oh, this like outlaw thing. I'm going to go do this, but it's never been, I I'm going to create moments for people now with the way it is now that it's deathmatch wrestling, not just death matches we can actually put the wrestling and use stuff from the wrestling to help them make the death matches better. And also to create moments that other people will create in, in wrestling matches, but also in death matches. And that's literally why I do it. I just want to, I want to do things that people remember. I want to be remembered. It's, it's sad, but like when we're, everybody says it, when we're done wrestling, are we going to be remembered? And that's the one thing a lot of dudes end up asking themselves, am I going to mm. be remembered five years down the line? I want to at least try to have one person, out of that thousand people that might be in that building, remember me for the next five years for something that I did. Well, I'm getting a hybrid uh, question from earlier in this question. And you mentioned in uh, 2020, uh, Deathmatch Wrestling took a leap forward to be more acceptable. Mm -hmm. As as I'm going to call you a leader in the industry, what does it have to do now to take that next step? And what would be the next step? I wish I knew. You know, one thing I do say is I say, uh, why can't death matches be accepted to where we get to be on like a streaming platform or a bigger platform? Like all these, you we've seen Lucha Underground, which is straight Lucha Libre, get a bigger platform. You know, mm -hmm. AEW became like the WCW. They had a bigger platform outside of the, the norm WWE. New Japan came from Japan over to United States, did stuff with Access. They had a bigger platform. So how can we, and it's like, I wish I knew the answer, but it's like, how can deathmatch wrestling take the next leap into like a bigger platform can we get something going on a, on a streaming platform could we have, find like that initial person that can organize it to the point where we can be accepted enough where more than a thousand people can watch us you know and that's that to me is the next leap will it ever happen i don't know i feel like sometimes maybe deathmatch wrestling is just too violent for for the everyday crowd but uh, people thought about that when they thought of ecw in the 90s and i was watching ecw when it was happening so uh, I, I think anything's possible, man. I really do. So I think that's where the next leap would be if it was, if there was to be a leap for deathmatch wrestling. Well, I think what it's going to take is, and I think GCW has something that it can do for this genre of wrestling. Um, they're finally coming to San Francisco, and I'm hoping that you're on that show. Um, and for a little plug, one of my songs off my new EP is the actual theme music for that particular show. And thank God that they're finally coming here. And I'm hoping that, you know, you're, you're part of that, um, that show. But I feel like, you know, where the next step is always, I think it's going to be production. I yeah. think it's going to be production value and how you're going to um, sort of hmm, display it to the world. And because I, I, it's not like violence is something that we're not accustomed to. Yeah, I, I, I don't think <laughs> blood, and, and blood and gore is something that this... Gener that the generations that are here now, I mean, you can go on the internet and look at beheadings if you want yep. to, right? You're right? And I don't, that's not necessarily something I, I want to do. But um, I think that this is, I, I, I've never understood that connection, right? So do you see it in the sense of like, if we were just only given um, uh, a more, because like you said, it's also money too, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, how does the production value raise? How do these things, but do you think GCW, you know, has the best chance to bring this to even a, a, a bigger audience uh, than it's ever been before in America? Yeah, of course they do. I feel like they've already, they've already kind of done that. Like uh, being the top indie promotion, drawing the amount of people they draw on pretty much a weekly basis at this point, they've already brought it to the masses. I've had people hit me up uh, you know, close to even recently and say, hey, this is the first time I've seen Deathmatch Wrestling and uh, you've helped me really fall into a genre of wrestling that I'm really into now. 
And that's shocking because Deathmatch Wrestling has been around since the 90s, even the 80s or some, and 70s and 60s. So for people to fall into it now means that we're taking a step in the right direction. I, I want to go back to GCW. You're under contract with them. Uh, being a Deathmatch wrestler and being under contract with a organization is kind of unheard of, at least up until 2020 and mm. GCW really going. Can you talk about when like that's first presented to you? Like it had to have been a pipe dream. Like, wait, time out. I'm about to be a contracted wrestler. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> contracted on the GCW. You might be thinking Nick Gage, but I could say for somebody, you know, coming from my, my perspective for Nick Gage, somebody who's put all the time in to be contracted under GCW is a big deal. And it actually gives hope just like when he did that match with Chris Jericho it gives hope to everybody else who's trying to do something, who is a deathmatch wrestler. It's not just, oh, we're, we're underutilized and we're not noticed. Now it's like, if hey, Nick Gage can do that. If he could get GCW to put him on their contract, if he could get on AEW and wrestle Chris Jericho in a deathmatch, anything's possible now. Literally, anything is possible. Brett, sign well, him right now. <laughs> well, I mean, is that something, but that's a, that's a great question, Dennis. It's like, you know, is this something that you want to do? I mean, would you want to be under contract or do you want to have – you know, that freedom to kind of pick and choose, like you said. If that contract was to set me up to where I didn't have to work a regular job and I could actually focus all my time uh, on on my craft and uh, what the company needs out of me, yeah, of course. Any You would be an idiot to be offered uh, a chance to make your dreams come true, which you will probably understand when you've signed your record contracts and all that when you first started doing music. It's like, it's an opportunity. And sometimes you know, it's a smaller opportunity that leads into a bigger opportunity, but at the end of the day, it's somebody's giving you a, a, a chance to create something for yourself that someday might become bigger than, your, than you. You know what I mean? But isn't there a yeah. fear? Because, you know, Lars and I talk about this all the time. I've got 20 years at my real job. Lars is like, you need to quit your job and do this full time. <laughs> I'm afraid. Well, I mean, I'm, and even if there right. was that contract, in front of me, the sign that would make me quit my job, there would be that fear there. Like, what if I failed? What am I going to do with a backdrop? Do you, do you think about that? Yeah, I've, I've already had these instances. So um, I graduate high school. I go to community college. This is back uh, around the time right before I started wrestling. So I start wrestling. I end up dropping out of college, getting into technical school. I graduate technical school. I get offered a big position uh, setting up POS systems for restaurants in the Philadelphia, New York area. Uh, it paid pretty decently. I had the opportunity to, to do something from a normal aspect and make a bunch of money doing it. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, it was it was put to me, hey, we have an opportunity for you to go to Europe to wrestle. You're not going to get paid much, <laughs> but it's, for, it's an opportunity for you to be seen. And I decided uh, not to take the technical uh, position with that company and then do this tour for Europe. Um, and then look, 15 years later, I'm still in wrestling and I'm still growing as a performer. So, I mean, it just depends on what you're trying to personally accomplish, man. But like you know, Lars was saying, like if you're 20 years deep at your job, but in, at the end of the day, you don't, that's not your passion, then maybe you have to reevaluate what you're doing and figure out what steps you have to take to make your dream happen. Because we're only here once in this lifetime. It, it's stupid to say and cliche to say we're only here once. This is, you know, we only, we only live once, we only die once. But at the end of the day, are you going to make the best of the opportunities that you're, you're given or the opportunities that are presented to you? Are you just going to, you're going to live that the lifestyle that you really, in all honesty, deep down, you don't want to live. And that's something that I even ask myself all the time when working a shoot job and I'm there for many years. It's like, do I want to keep doing this or, or do I need to work harder and grind harder and, and figure out how to make this wrestling thing into something more profitable and something more stable when it comes to being financially stable, you know? Well, you know, one of the things I guess I wanted to know is, you know, I think that when you do something for an extended amount of time and something that's very physical, you do have those moments when you think, well, if I get to this point, it's done. Um, and I think that there are some wrestlers out there where, you know, deathmatch included, where maybe their time as a viewer, it's kind of like, thank you for all that, that, that you've done. Now it's time for you to move on because you're not moving as well. It, it's actually looking way worse than it should or, or it's not as fluid anymore. And it's almost there just, just to be there. Do you have that kind of thing? Like if something happens or if I don't do this right or 
th these are, this is the moment when I know that I'm done. Because you have to have an exit plan, I feel, at some point, or at least that you must, it must have, have, have sort of entertained that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't have uh, went to technical school if that wasn't the case. But like, outside of that, like me personally, when I think about it, like if if wrestling ends in three years, I'm just going to end up working a shoot job unless I have some other venture going, which is why the reason I started trying to do podcasts as well, trying to learn different things, maybe different aspects of wrestling, like how mm -hmm. can I help the younger guys? Maybe that'll lead into something that's not an in-ring job, but maybe it's a backstage job you know, learning different things here and there, um, picking up little life skills that maybe could help me uh, when it comes to business at some point. Uh, as it, when it comes to, uh, to me, I don't really have set in stone, like, all right, this is what's going to happen when it's done. It's, it's, I'm going at maybe at some point, something will click, maybe it don't. And that personally, that's just me taking that chance. And that's not going to be with everybody. You have these guys who went to four-year colleges they actually have major degrees to fall back on. And I always stress to the younger people like, hey, you know, go to school, get something under your belt just in case if this doesn't work out because you won't be like somebody like me who's like, all right, if this ends, well, what do I have after this? And that, and at the end of the day, I've always been a hard worker regardless of what job I'm in, warehouse, retail, doesn't matter. Like I'm always going to put my foot to the ground because as I have a daughter. So now it's more than just about me. It's about her. So like I'm going to do whatever it takes to provide for her. So if wrestling was to end tomorrow, that's just the way I see it. Like, regardless of what I'm doing, I'm just going to put the boots to the ground and I'm going to work hard. Um, so that that's my fallback plan is just, I'm just going to do what I have to do when it ends. Lars, it's uh, almost time for the hottest new game in all the podcasts that we've been doing. Do you have any more questions for him before we play the game? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I don't want to like set up a trap or anything like that, but I mean, <laughs> I'm good. No, no. But here's the one thing. I, there has to have been at some point legitimate heat in these types of, I mean, because it's, it's easy enough to do just with, you know, your traditional professional wrestling. Is, have you had those moments where it's been legit, like, motherfucker, we are going on now? Because, I mean, it's, it's a whole different, you know, mentality with this deathmatch stuff. There, has there ever been that moment for you? More so in regular wrestling, honestly, than uh, okay, I've gotten into okay. more, more slight fist fights in regular wrestling than I have in uh, death matches. I think for the most part, a lot of the death match locker rooms are a brotherhood. And if there is heat, people are real weird about it. We don't really like not everybody comes out about it. Like, I, you know, I've had my tips with John Wayne Murdoch, who's now in GCW, and we've had our little differences like wrestling wise and legit wise when it comes to just wrestling in general. But uh, when you're in the ring, we understand we have to keep each other safe because this isn't just a regular fist fight. Like, <laughs> this could end somebody's life really fast. So, I mean, everyone pretty much has a great amount of patience when it comes to death matches and that type of situation. You know, unlike wrestling, where I've I've literally, me and, me and other guys have punched each other in the face a bunch of times just to say, hey, like, get back on track. Right, right, right. Well, I guess, and a small last question, do you think – you know, and I don't, I don't think that there, there are, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Yeah. but are there any kind of producers or anybody that helps you with these matches at these types of shows? Or is it just kind of like, it's just up to you two? Uh, it's usually up to us because a, a lot of the more veteran guys, um, they're not, this is not their thing. This is death matching is an old art form to some degree, but like it's, it's sort of newer, if that makes sense. And when it yeah. comes to being in the mainstream and being viewed at, as wrestling, it's newer. So we don't, there's not too many guys out there who are agents of that. And that's one thing I joke with guys about. I'm like, if I'm going to get any job when I'm done wrestling, I'm going to be a hardcore advisor. Like I'm going to be the, the, the agent, like, Hey, this is what you need to do in these type of matches, because there's nobody out there doing that at all. Well, that, that, that I'm sorry, but that's the reason why I'm asking that question, because like you said, I don't, you know, I'm doing this podcast Maybe you could be the first death mat match agent. That's it. I, that, I, that, that, it's already been in my head, man. <laughs> all right. There we You're go. Stroking I, yeah. I got to say that question, Lars, just made me want one more question. And uh, it's and I don't know why you and I have never asked this question as many guys have come on. How do you guys do the budget for a match? Do you get, come in and do you go, all right, uh, 20 light, two, <laughs> five bricks, two ladders, <laughs> Uh, that comes out to 200 bucks or do they go, all right, you have $500. What do you want? Yeah. It's, this is what you have. 
uh, what do you want? Or what do you want to do? Sometimes weeks ahead of advance, they'll be like, hey, what do you want to do? And if I have an idea, we'll construct it, you know? And that you'll get people who draw blueprints and it gets it gets wild. But sometimes it's what we have on hand and sometimes it's, hey, well, what do you want? All right. I don't know why we've never asked the budget question. Yeah, I, I guess I've just, I thought it was just the promoter with a Home Depot card. Just kind of going, here you go. Light tubes you know? are getting expensive, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, because of you, inflation, way to go. Yeah. <laughs> all right, it's time for the hottest new game in all of wrestling podcasts, brought to you by <laughs> Lars Fredrickson's tour. And somewhere on the screen there will be tour dates. And uh, I just got word they can buy autographed EPs at your show. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, of course, you know, what I try to do is is different variations of the records, you know, because I think it keeps it interesting as a collector. That's something that I'm always into. But, uh, you know, you have a tour edition so that you can only get this particular lime neon green version of the new EP if you physically come to the show. And today I went and autographed 300 of them. So uh, let's just say that I'm going to be um, uh, my wrist work is done for the week over at Pirate Press, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's do our game because I think Alex is going to be a pretty interesting one. Alex, please. Have patience with us. Uh, yeah. Dennis, can you please explain the game? So basically, we guess what you are watching. Now, the game has evolved. This is uh, episode three of the game. Then We may be recording this out of order. You never know sometimes. So as of this recording, this is game three. Uh, we're tied at one. And what are you currently watching? Let's say that. Yeah. Uh, we It's a three rounds. Me, Lars and I will each take turns guessing what you are watching, and then you hand out whether half a point or a whole point on whether what we're what, what our guess for you is close to. All right, All that's, right. Sounds that's, good. A, that's a nod of acceptance. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> that was like, motherfucker, what did I do? It was yeah. all good up until that very end. These fucking kooks. I will okay. uh, go first. You went first last time. Uh, yeah. Looking at you, um, and by the way, wrestling doesn't count in sporting events, does not count. Because that's just easy. Uh, looking at you, I'm going to guess that you are watching Dexter. Nope. Well, I'm, you know, I, this is kind of a little bit of a cheat, but I'm, I'm, bet, I'm, betting, I'm betting that he's watching a lot of Disney movies. <laughs> you son of no? a bitch. Nope, no Disney. Oh, shit. I just thought the kid, you know. That is that is cheating, and I well, like whatever. it. Well, that, that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's a hill I mean, move right there. The fucking a, fucking a. <laughs> it gets very intense, by the way. It's our death match podcast version <laughs> of it. Um, all right. So first round zero zero. Looking, um, I'm gonna say, God, what's uh, what's the uh, what's the uh, the book of Bubba Fett? Talk about Star Wars. Yeah. I'm not a Star Wars guy, so you're not gonna catch me watching Star Wars ever. <laughs> no. He's like he's like La Greca. Yeah, hates Star Wars. All right, then uh, then I'm gonna have to go with. Uh, I think it's a TV series. I think uh, I'm gonna probably have to say uh, Ozark. Ding ding ding! How good go? There it is. There's the man. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's a full point, one nothing. Here it is. This is my chance to tie or I lose. Uh, if you're watching Ozark, uh, then I'm going to guess that you might be a Law and Order fan. Nope. I know Ice T is, but come on. <laughs> All right. What are you watching? Because you win, Lars. I know I win. So now, what are you watching, Alex? I'm watching Ozark. That's, that's it. it? You guess right. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm on the show. first season. That's wow. Amazing. You not guess the show any, on anything else? No, uh, I mean uh, wrestling related. Yeah, but for the most part, I've been binge watching Ozark for the past weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wow. know. I Lars wins. <laughs> yeah, Lars, you know I win. Well, thank <laughs> you, Alex, dude. Super stoked. You know that you came on. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I'm sorry I was a little late today. But um, it's truly an honor to have you on this show and talk about what you do, because it's, in my opinion, I think you're the best at what, what 
deathmatch wrestling is. I think that you are the pinnacle. You are the man. That, you are the man. You are, you know, the Ric Flair of that genre. And I just want you to know that, that that's the way I think Thank about you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, for everybody at home, the podcast is over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Hey, wrestling perspective, Alex, thank you. Thank you.